Look, I think everybody wants children to be back uh, in classrooms, face-to-face -face teaching, with face-to-face -face teaching as soon as it's safe for students and staff to be there. Uh, what, we, what we have seen, though, is a lot of confusion between the Commonwealth Government and some state leaders about whether it's the right time or not. What parents would really like is one clear message uh, about whether they should be sending their children to school. And what they're also looking for to reassure them, I think, is making sure that schools, uh, the, the cleaning's upgraded, that the bathroom facilities are adequate for children to be practising good hygiene, washing their hands often and properly. And we need, of course, to be protecting any staff who've got particular health vulnerabilities if they're immune compromised themselves or they've got someone at home who's immune compromised. Um, I, I don't think, um, I think the real problem here is that there's a fight between the Commonwealth and the state, in some states, about whether that's happened or not. And in that case, what we need to be doing is listening to state leaders because they're the ones who run schools in their states day to day. But we all share the desire for getting kids back to school as soon as it's safe to do so. Yeah, the medical advice seems to have never have changed, at least at a national cabinet level, uh, but then that is the baseline and then states like Victoria making decisions on their own. Is that where the confusion is? And if the medical advice to National Cabinet has always been that it is safe for students, what's the problem? Well, I think the, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer uh, also said that it's important for states and territories um, to interpret that medical advice for their own um, circumstances. So it's obvious that if you've got a state or territory where there's been uh, no transmission of COVID-19 community transmission for some time, that's different to a state or a region, a local area where there's you know, widespread or continuing community transmission. It is important, when I say there needs to be consistent advice, that doesn't mean that um, every school across Australia has to be doing the same thing at the same time. Uh, what we don't want is a different interpretation of advice from the Commonwealth Government and the states. If there is a difference in interpretation of the health advice, then we need to listen to uh, state governments because it's the states that are running the schools day to day. OK, a few other things in your portfolio. Universities could fly in foreign students under strict quarantine measures. Is that a good idea? Well, I think it's up to the government and universities to explain how that would be done safely. What I know for sure is that if uh, any other industry of the size of the international education industry was struggling in the way that universities and vocational education providers are struggling, the government would be sitting down and having a conversation with them about how to keep them going. I mean, this is a sector that employs 260 thousand people. Universities have said that they'll lose 21,000 staff over the next six months. And it's not just people think, oh, well, you know, big deal, Sydney University, Melbourne University in the centre of town. Think about the universities that have regional campuses, uh, you know, in Launceston or Rockhampton or Townsville uh, or, um, or Armidale. The, the difference that taking a, a bunch of students out of those regional economies means to the landlords who are renting to them, the cafes that are selling them a cup of coffee and a smashed avocado, uh, uh, th this is a really important um, export dollar earner for Australia and the government has completely dropped the ball. Uh, it is good um, to think that they might be in conversation with universities about how we can safely welcome international students back to Australia, but it'll be up to the government and the university sector to explain what protocols would be in place. There's many sectors in our economy that will just not bounce back after COVID-19 finally does pass, whenever that may be. Apprenticeships is one of those areas. How would you encourage businesses to take on apprentices and what kind of incentives should the government be offering? Look, I'm very concerned. We saw uh, just in the most recent figures a 73% drop in the number of uh, apprenticeships advertised. Uh, I know I've, I've spoken to uh, small businesses, particularly in the construction sector myself, who say they've been struggling to keep their apprentices on. The government did uh, early on offer a subsidy for apprentice, apprentices that's, you know, one small step uh, in the right direction. But this is a really critical problem for us. We had skills shortages before COVID-19 hit. If we lose all those apprentices, if we lose that pipeline, 
we'll just have an explosion of those skills shortages at a time when uh, temporary migration and migration generally is actually on hold. We won't be welcoming a lot of migrants to Australia in, in the next few years because but essentially because we're going to try and keep this virus at bay. Well, that means that we need to meet those skill shortages with Australians as the economy starts to rebuild. We absolutely need to be properly funding our TAFE and apprenticeship program. We've seen $3 billion of cuts in recent years to TAFE and training. The government must restore uh, that funding that they've cut. And we need to look at um, we need to look at adult apprenticeships, uh, retraining people who've lost their jobs mid-career. We need to look at um, trades taster courses for young people who are leaving school, who are thinking about, do I want to be a carpenter, electrician, plumber? Uh, do I want to um, go into uh, some other area of shortage, like uh, being a chef or a hairdresser? Um, making it possible for people to test out uh, whether they're interested in those, area of uh, those areas of study. And as we rebuild, as we begin to invest in stimulus projects, employers really need to think about where their pipeline of workers is coming from. They need to be investing in training the next generation of tradespeople in their areas. They need to take some responsibility to do that. Uh, there's a story in The Age this morning from Rob Harris that Anthony Albanese has warned Shadow Cabinet that post-pandemic there's going to be a complete rethink of your policies. Would you be comfortable dropping Labor's long-standing Gonski reforms, at least the quantum of funding? Well, I think uh, Labor will always um, want to invest in education, including education for the most disadvantaged children, making sure that they catch up. A lot of kids have fallen behind during this period, and we know that if kids fall behind, uh, if they haven't caught up by the age of eight, they struggle throughout their schooling. I'm also particularly worried about vulnerable teenagers who feel disengaged from school, and I don't want them to join the long-term unemployment queues. So we will always be looking for ways of investing in education, particularly for the most disadvantaged kids, uh, TAFE and training and uh, universities. But look, I'm realistic too, Laura. Nothing will be the same. Nothing will be the same for some time to come. Uh, we're going to need to look at ways of um, restarting our economy. What we don't want to see is the, the same old tired arguments from conservatives. We've just got to do drop big business taxes and slash wages for low paid workers and that'll somehow fix things. That's not how we rebuild. That's absolutely the wrong way to rebuild. So it's quite right for Anthony to lead a conversation now about what sort of economy and what sort of society we want to rebuild to. It's, it, it's necessary and, and right to be doing that. Um, but we're not going to just, uh, you know, slide into the tired old tropes that you see um, uh, from some people, the, the lazy sort of approach that says if we slash wages, somehow the animal spirits of the market will be released and everything will snap back. Um, we've got to invest in our people, make sure that we are training people for the jobs that become available, make sure that we're working with businesses and unions to identify those opportunities and supercharge them, make sure that we've got... Um, you know, cheap, clean power to uh, power a new uh, manufacturing base in Australia. These are all things that should be on the table for discussion right now. Just quickly before I let you go, Eden Monero, it would be extraordinary for Labor to lose this at this stage, at the risk of giving you a free hit here. Well, look, we've got a fantastic candidate down there in Christy McBain who uh, impressed people so much uh, with her... Uh, compassionate, hard-working approach during the bushfires, when, particularly when Scott Morrison was missing in action uh, in that area. And uh, I, I think the, the chaos we've seen from the Liberals and Nationals in recent days where they can't seem to find anyone who wants to represent the area, where in fact they're talking about resurrecting Tony Abbott as a candidate for Eden Monero, tells you all you need to know about um, the, the preparedness of the Liberals and Nationals to turn their backs on the people of Eden Monero. They, they just don't care. And, um, and Christy McBain obviously does. She's a passionate defender of her local community.